Number 15. My dad met Richard Ramirez while working as a prison guard. My dad is probably the most jaded person I know. I have never seen him intimidated by anyone. When he was retelling this story, he got a really scared look on his face. For some context, Richard Ramirez was the second Night Stalker in Southern California. He had recently been caught and was temporarily being housed in the prison my dad worked at. My dad was assigned to him, and after meeting him, he refused to ever go near him again. There were these women that would visit him and bring him things, and they always looked terrified. But this man was so manipulative and effective with speech that they were completely under his control. He would look you directly in the eye and say things like, are you happy with your life? And, I can get you anything you could ever want if you do what I say. The worst part is that you would believe it. He had this way of speaking and getting inside your head that made you feel powerless and like you had to rely on him. My dad said that out of all of his years in law enforcement, to this day, that is the only time that he felt like he was in the presence of someone truly evil. Number 14. So, this literally just happened about six hours ago. I watch a lot of creepy stories on YouTube and had heard of Reddit through there. This is one of those instances in life that really makes you wonder how fucked up people really are and that true monsters look like humans. I hope this story gets read and can help save a life someday. Backstory My wife and I don't live together. She had become abusive over the last few months, mostly towards our daughter. Our daughter is almost 18 months old and is my whole world. I am unemployed at the moment, but my mother had been helping me out a lot. Today around 4 p.m., I took my daughter to the store. I usually do this around the time she wakes up from her nap. My daughter is a very active child and can't seem to sit still for more than 10 minutes without getting cranky. I usually let her walk with me, holding her hand and patiently walking at her pace. I usually get just a juice for her, but had to get some extra groceries that I was short on. Flour, sugar and some noodles. I also remembered we were low on milk and grabbed a gallon on our way back. With all that I was carrying, I wasn't able to hold her hand. I made sure to walk behind her, but that only makes her walk slowly. As we made our way to the registers, I was continuously urging her to keep walking, which she would do but only for a second before her attention would get drawn to another rickety box with whatever was on sale, or she would see something colorful on a lower shelf. I was getting a bit frustrated, but I wasn't showing it in my voice. I kept urging her to keep walking, and she kept getting sidetracked. With everything I was carrying, I started to wish I had grabbed a basket. At the front, their customer service desk holds register one, which was thankfully open. I want to take the time to mention that my daughter is very fond of saying hi and waving at everyone. I set everything up to get rung up, but the service attendant was busy with a return at the customer service area, so I had to wait. The entrance to the store is to my right. The only exit is behind the service desk, which leads into the small foyer before leading to the other doors. As people enter, they have to pass the customer service desk. I was being fatherly to my daughter, trying to entertain her with patty cake and the itsy bitsy spider while we waited for the cashier to check us out. My daughter would frequently wave at people passing and say hi in her squeaky toddler voice. Some people would smile and wave, while others would stop to adore her. At this point, I'm used to people doing that. 
It makes me happy knowing my daughter isn't a shy, cranky little asshole like some of the kids you see in the stores like this. The lady was ready to check us out, and I told my daughter to hold my hand since I wouldn't be looking her way. I had to pull my wallet out to retrieve my debit card to pay for the groceries and let her hand go for a moment. I kept looking her way to make sure she wasn't wandering off. The lady went to hand me my receipt when she all of a sudden yelled at someone behind me. What are you doing with his daughter? She bellowed as I turned to look at a man who had picked her up and started running towards the entrance doors. I was shocked. The doors didn't open since they were a one-way set of doors and the cashier quickly picked up the phone yelling that she was calling the police. I was stunned at the point of immobilization but quickly realized what was going on. I have a pocket knife that I usually carry on me so I can break the seal on my daughter's juice. I quickly ran after the man as someone started to make their way through the entrance doors. He didn't get a chance to run through before I slammed my fist across his temple. I decided not to use the knife in case I might get in trouble. The man stumbled and I grabbed my daughter from his arms. He then proceeded to run out the door empty-handed. The police arrived about five minutes later and asked me what I had seen. I explained that I hadn't seen the man's face since he had shaggy long hair and a beard. He was also wearing a hoodie, which wasn't that much of a surprise. They took the statement of several witnesses, including the cashiers, and had already had other officers searching the area. Someone had said the guy had ran behind the building, but the officers didn't find anyone. The police took us home, and then asked more questions like, Have you seen him before? Do you know anyone who looks like the man? And then proceeded to ask about the home life. CPS had been over earlier in the day to discuss my wife's mental health plan, and the police had been there earlier as well. The officers asked if we needed any groceries or anything else. I told them no. The officers left, leaving me their cards in case I saw the guy around the area. About 20 minutes later, I got a knock at the door. To my surprise, the officers had returned with the largest box of pampered diapers I had ever seen, a large box of wipes, about six large Winko bags of groceries, and a couple bags of toys. I fell to my knees and cried after they left us. I had spent almost five minutes choking back tears as I thanked them. They had left us with a Christmas card saying I was a strong father to have had so much go on recently and that my daughter was lucky to have such a great father. There was a hundred dollars in the card too, wrapped in a note that said to get a drink or two if I needed it. I don't drink, so I will probably get some extra Christmas presents for my mom and daughter. So, to the fucker that tried to kidnap my daughter, I hope the police find you. Number 13. Mike Tyson and not the mic today that'll take a selfie with you for Instagram just because you asked, but the coked up one who just got his face tattooed and would eat your kids if he ever heard the word selfie come out of your mouth. It was in 02 or 03 at a BET Awards after party in LA. I'm at the bar waiting for drinks and he comes up right beside me by himself, no bodyguards, no friends, no one. He's talking shit about everyone, the bartender, waitress, go-go dancer, the guy to his left, and before he could say anything about me, I look over and give him a, what's up Mike? Keep in mind, I'm starstruck as fuck, but I deliver that what's up Mike so calmly you would have thought I knew the man for years. After I said that, he looked at me and his face lit up and gave me a hug. Now, I'm 6'2", Mike's maybe 5'9", and I've never felt so small. 
This hug felt like I had just walked into a jail cell, and there was Bubba waiting for some fresh meat. I've yet to have a more uncomfortable hug in my life. After he lets go, we have a conversation, mostly about me being in the Air Force that lasts for maybe five minutes. This again was one of the most confusing conversations I've ever had. There were points in the conversation where I thought that he was about to whoop my ass. He would talk about George Bush and why I would want to serve a guy like that while looking at me dead in the eye like there's a ref between us asking to touch gloves. Then he would start smiling and finish it with a, Man, this is a great party. Definitely one of the scariest and most what-the-fuck moments of my life. I met some fucked up people and been in some sketchy situations, but meeting Mike tops them all just for the simple fact that I've never had someone put me on an emotional roller coaster like that from a five minute conversation. Number 12. Knew a guy, 5'8 or so, always dressed like an old school librarian. Quiet guy, friendly. We were having drinks after work, and some 6'2 Neanderthal was getting rough with some girl outside the bar. The Neanderthal had four similarly cavemen-like friends with him. I'm a fairly big guy, and I stepped in and said, Mate, how do you step back and leave the lady alone? This gorilla turned on me and punched me in the face before I knew what was happening, and I'm on my ass. All five of them moved towards me when my friend stepped in and abso fucking lootly obliterated all five in about 30 seconds. There was no fancy flying kicks or such. His fighting style was the most brutally understated thing I had ever seen. It was efficient, it was cold, and these guys got hurt bad. Turns out he was like an 8th generation military man from some African family that took their whole soldier thing terribly serious and had spent a dozen years in some South African Recon Commando Special Forces para fucking sniper unit. Before that, he reckoned his military service actually started when he was four as the whole extended family was run like some military training camp. He bailed from South Africa and moved to Australia and became an accountant. Number 11. I was waiting in the general lobby of the emergency room, waiting for my wife, girlfriend at the time. She was taken to a separate room where she could get scanned for some abdominal pains. Anyways, there was an older gentleman, mid-40s, who sat right next to me and starts a conversation with me. I didn't pay too much mind to it, keeping it to small talk. Well, this guy goes on to tell me that he comes in to commit himself and that he's required to do it at least once a month. I was like, oh yeah, sure. Not in a rude way, but enough to make it believable that I'm intrigued. He goes on about other stuff, what he's done in the past years, etc. Five hours go by and I haven't heard from my girlfriend. I get noticeably worried, and he takes notice, states that he can take me to her. I said that it's nothing to worry about, and that I'm expecting a call any minute from her, but he insisted. Literally gets up, walks past the security guards and nurses. They don't say anything to him. In fact, they have a chit-chat, and talk as if they are best friends on first name basis. In the end, they give him and I the okay to go see my girlfriend. He led me through the labyrinth of hallways, and directly to her without getting lost, like he's been there before. I chat with my girlfriend, got an update from her, then went back to the lobby. As I sat down, the guy goes on about what he and his bro used to do when they were little. Stupid kid things, blah blah blah. Then the incident with the kitten. That's when my focus shifted. 
He said that he put a kitten in the microwave and turned it on, and recalls the noises the poor animal made in its last moments. I'll spare other details. My eyes came to meet his, a man who I just met a few hours ago, and all I could feel was hatred towards him now. His eyes were just hollow, hard to describe, yet piercing. He said something that I'll never forget. I got your attention now, boy. Didn't even crack a smile. Number 10. I met a Vietnam vet on a camping trip named Lube. No shit. He looked like a poster child for the Navy sailor. Just a broad, mustached dude. He was built like the bulldog from Tom and Jerry. Just a huge guy. Also one of the nicest guys I've ever met. I asked him for tips as he was making char, and he showed me how to properly sharpen my knife. Eventually he started telling stories, and people asked what he did to get so big. He says, Every morning when I wake up, I roll onto the floor and do a thousand push-ups, then I flip over and do a thousand sit-ups. Well, then I noticed this piece of beef jerky looking stuff hanging from some twine around his neck, so I asked what it was. He kind of laughed and then said, Well, when I came back from Nam, I was pretty messed up. I ended up slicing off the meat off the front of my shin and then jerkying it. He then rolls up his pant leg and shows us this huge scar on his shin much bigger than the piece on his necklace. So I said, that's a lot bigger than the piece around your neck. Yeah, <laughs> I've been chewing on it. This was in like 1999, and I thought surely this guy is just telling stories. So I asked another guy I knew who served with him. Nope, those stories are true. This badass sliced his own leg meat off, jerkied it, and hung it around his neck, and the fucker would chew on it. I was still pretty skeptical. I mean, sure, he's huge and mean looking, but he's so nice. Sure enough, the next morning I see him literally roll out of his hammock, land on his chest, and start pounding out push-ups. Maybe not your typical scary story, but for damn sure someone I want to really like me. I have other stories about him if you're interested. Story 1 So while we were camping, I seem to remember him telling this story. Lube loved knives, but he didn't look at them as tools. Well in the 90s, he lived in a really bad area, so he used to patrol his neighborhood in the evening to make sure everything was copacetic. Apparently one time he was walking down the street and he comes upon this gang of guys. One of them pulls a switchblade on him and demands his money. Apparently along the lines of, give me what you got or I'm going to stab you old man. So Lou being Lou reaches behind his back and pulls out what I remember hearing was a bowie knife and says, like this, then runs the knife through the other forearm, like straight through, to the guard. Apparently the guy's response was screaming, You're crazy! To which Lube replied, You're damn right. Then after they ran off, he went home and cleaned and stitched himself up. He did have a ton of knives with him, and hanging around his neck, Besides what I assume was jerkied flesh, was also a small straight knife, a medium straight knife, and some kind of turquoise jewelry. Story 2 So if any of you remember the hunt for Eric Rudolph in the late 90s and early 2000s, he was wanted in connection with several bombings, but had taken refuge in the Appalachia wilderness the FBI had been hunting him for some time, and there was another militia group 
that was out there assisting the FBI with the search. Lube and a couple of other guys on this camping trip had been a part of that. They're out there searching for this guy, basically making a grid of the area and then searching the grid a square at a time. So this new guy shows up out of nowhere and is really in the middle of everything and wanting to go on each search and basically acting really suspicious. So a couple of guys decide he might be a mole or a friend of the guy they're looking for who was reporting on where we are searching and giving him a heads up. Either that, or he's an FBI mole. Either way, it makes them uneasy. Supposedly the FBI method of searching the Carolina forests was to drive down the roads at moderate speed with a lookout on each side of the vehicle, so I don't think their search was going very well. And then again, I wasn't there. But anyway, no one really likes or trusts this guy, so while everyone is getting ready to go out, they tell the guy to watch camp that day, and for Lube to keep an eye on the guy they don't trust. I'm not sure what else was said. I'm not sure what Lube heard. All I know is when my dad, who had been part of the group, came back to the camp a little early, he'd gotten stung by a ton of wasps or hornets. All he saw was this guy tied head to toe to a tree with his hand tied behind him, then Lube sitting about three feet away from the guy in a camp chair sharpening that bowie knife of his and looking the tied up guy dead in the eyes. They had been gone for eight hours. My dad runs up to him like, What the hell, Lube? Well, you told me to keep an eye on him, and that's what I've been doing. He ain't going anywhere, Lube says, with a shitting grin on his face. I don't think that guy came back to camp. Number 9 So this was told to me by an old family friend, Nikki, numerous times as a kid growing up, as one of those life advice stories to keep in mind through the years. And to her credit, I have never forgotten it. Whenever anything associated with hitchhiking comes up, it always springs to mind and probably always will. It makes me a bit ill whenever I think about it, actually. So, Nikki, who grew up at the same time as my dad, so this was about the early 80s, I believe, was a young woman in her mid-twenties. She's one of those real kind-hearted souls always willing to help another out in a time of need, you know. And I can't imagine her being anything other than that when she was younger, so I totally see her doing this too. So, driving into the city, about two hours or so drive out from town, she saw a man walking down the side of the road. As she neared, he turned and, in typical hitchhiker manner, stuck out the old arm and thumb. Nikki, bless her heart, pulled over and asked him if he needed any help. She told me that he was really polite, if not a bit shy. When he asked for a lift into the city, Nikki gave a smile and popped open the passenger door for the guy, who tossed his bag into the back seat and buckled up for the ride ahead. They talked pleasantly for most of the trip, about friends, the news, etc., you know, happy small talk. She felt that they were getting on really well, and even bought him dinner at the pitch stop a little over halfway there. She says he seemed really flustered and awkward when she paid, but one of the things they had talked about was money and how he was pretty dang strapped for cash, which was why he was hitchhiking in the first place, but he eventually relented and they went on their way. As soon as they got into the city, he thanked her profusely for the ride and the food and asked to be dropped off once they hit downtown. Before getting out, he asked for Nikki's phone number so he could contact her someday and catch up. Thrilled at the prospect of knowing how her new friend was faring, Nikki wrote it down for him and drove off with the warm feeling of a good deed done. 
Now I'm sorry if you were expecting something creepy to have happened by now, but I think this is what freaked me out so much as a kid. How nice everything seemed to have worked out. Nikki gets this crease in her forehead and a funny look in her eye when she tells me the next part. How a week later, she got a phone call from her driving buddy. He didn't let her get a word in edgewise after hello and told her that she should thank God that she was raised so nice because when he first got in her car, he was planning on raping and murdering her once they got to that pit stop that he was going to steal that car and dump her body in a ditch further down the road and go on his merry way. But after she talked with him so kindly and treated him to dinner with a smile on her face, he couldn't bring himself to do it. He didn't think that he could live with himself after doing that to such a nice lady. Please, please, Nikki, please. Never, ever, pick up another hitchhiker. Then he hung up the phone. Nikki never got a call from him again. When she tried redialing the number, she got a payphone. Number 8. My dad worked at a beachside bar and grill when I was little. In addition to being a chef, he ran and DJed the bike and car shows for the restaurant. The car shows were usually on Wednesdays, and the bike nights were on Friday. A small detail, but important to the story. The car shows were on a school night, so I was rarely allowed to go, but my father would often bring me to the bike nights. By all accounts, I was an adorable and pretty mellow kid, and the bikers absolutely loved me. And yes, you might say that this was no environment for a little girl, but I learned a lot about loyalty and friendship from being around bikers. My dad told me that some of them would call into the restaurant just to ask if I would be there that week, and they'd often bring me stuffed animals and candy. My favorite of the bikers was a man that I affectionately called Uncle Teddy. He was a friend of my parents and an absolute mountain of a man, around 6'8", and 400 pounds easily. He was an ex-marine who loved his Harley and his cigars, and every week for five years he would bring me a Butterfinger and a Beanie Baby. I was six years old the night it happened in 2003. My father brought me to the bike show as he normally did, but I couldn't keep my eyes open past 8 p.m. The show didn't end until 10, so my dad had gotten into the habit of putting an air mattress in the back of the restaurant and he and Teddy would check on me every 15 minutes. I was asleep when I felt a hand on my shoulder. It was a man that I'd seen around before and he wasn't dressed in biker gear. He was wearing a short sleeve plaid shirt and jeans and looked greasy but not particularly scary. He smiled at me and told me that his name was Sean, and that he was a friend of my dad's, and that my dad had asked him to drive me home. My parents had tried to ingrain stranger danger in me, and they told me a thousand times never to talk to anyone I didn't know. But he knew mine and my dad's name, as well as the nickname everyone called me, and I totally bought it. I got up, grabbed the flamingo beanie baby Uncle Teddy had given me and started to walk towards the parking lot. Sean didn't have a bike. He had a very old four-door sedan. He opened the back door for me and I climbed inside. You know how in senior citizens' homes they often have plastic-wrapped couches or chairs? That's what the back seat of his car was like, totally covered in plastic. I think now that it was probably so there would be no trace of DNA left behind. Sean started to drive away, and to this day I can't believe how lucky I got. He had parked the car behind the restaurant in a way that it wasn't immediately visible to the bike show. But as he pulled away, I saw Teddy heading through the door, presumably to check on me. 
He just happened to look up at the exact moment, probably to acknowledge the car, and I smiled at him. Uncle Teddy didn't waste a moment, didn't even stop to tell my dad what was going on. He got on his bike and was on that car's ass before we had even totally cleared the avenue that led out of the parking lot. The avenue that you had to take to get to the restaurant was long, about a mile and a half, and then you had to go down another long road before it made it to the highway. Sean saw Teddy approaching in his rear view and attempted to speed up, but he must have realized it was futile. He'd been seen, and Teddy had his license plate number and a good description. Sean stopped the car, turned around, and told me very calmly to get out of the car. I was scared by this point, and I didn't waste a moment climbing out and running to Teddy. Sean burnt rubber driving away, and Teddy held me for a moment before putting me on the back of his bike and taking me back to my dad. By the time we got back, cops had been called, and they were surrounding the place. A lot of the show had emptied out, and my dad was sobbing and screaming on the sidewalk outside of the restaurant. I'll never forget that moment. I ran up to him, hugged him as tightly as I could, and then the rest is all a blur. I talked to the cops. I talked to my dad. I even went down to the station and spoke to a sketch artist. I didn't even get home until around 2am. Teddy never left my side. An APB was put out on the vehicle, which had been reported as stolen. The sketch circulated around the local news station, but it didn't turn up anything concrete. At one point, I was asked to look at a lineup, but none of them were him. Fast forward about eight years. I was 14, and my dad decided I was old enough to know what happened. Sean had been spotted lurking around the bike show a few times before that night and was a customer at the restaurant fairly regularly. He knew my nickname because he had been watching me for over a month. He knew my schedule and consequently how often Teddy and my dad checked on me. When his evil plan was botched and Teddy brought me back to the show, everyone had left. I'd assumed it was because the police had been investigating a crime scene, but I was wrong. They were all out looking for Sean. Teddy told them the make and model of the car with a description of Sean, and one of the guys thought that he sounded like a guy that frequented one of the biker bars downtown. I remember my dad paused for a long time, and I asked him what happened after that. They found him. Number 7. I went to high school with this terrifying girl. She was overweight, never shaved her legs, or anything for that matter, had acne all over her body, and looked like she had never showered. Aside from her physical appearance, the things she said were really fucking creepy. She would always talk about death and killing people. She shaved her head one day, Britney Spears style, and kept it like that for months. She had been suspended several times for making threats on other students. Not the, I'm gonna kick your ass kind, but the, I swear I'm gonna kill you if you come to school tomorrow threats. In class she would always doodle pictures of guns and knives. She had been removed from class multiple times for freaking out on teachers and students and even flipped a desk one time. She wasn't bullied that badly. People mostly just avoided her. I was always nice to her, mostly because I was fucking scared of her. Anyways, one day I'm in class talking to my friend about school clubs. The scary girl came up and started talking to us. My friend was really freaked out, but I tried to make conversation she ended up saying something along the lines of, Yeah, I've always wanted to start the Future School Shooters of America Club. I was thoroughly freaked out. My friend and I decided to go to guidance and tell a counselor about it. 
I hadn't seen her since. I have no idea what happened to her. Sometimes I feel bad about it, knowing that I probably got her expelled. But another part of me says that I may have stopped a school shooting. Number 6. A friend of mine. He's only 19, but there's seriously something dark about him. One time we were in a parking lot with some friends, and this jerk yells at us across the lot, just being a D-bag. I ignore him, whatever, but my friend gave him this look. I don't know how to explain it. It was like death incarnate, like whatever thoughts he had became physical. I was seriously afraid. It wasn't just an angry look. It was literally murderous. Not too long after, he looked at me in a rapey sort of way. It was like he looked through me. Boy, I felt weird. Thing is, I can now recognize that particular look. Not too long after that incident, I was watching a TV documentary about Chinese kids addicted to the internet being put in special camps. At one point, a boy is told to talk with his father about his feelings. Anyway, the boy gave him the exact same look as my friend did. I told my mom, he wants to kill him. Sure enough, not a few moments later, he gets up and almost strangles his dad before people pull him off. My mom was shocked. I've seen actors try to pull it off. Nope, it cannot be replicated. Anyway, there's just something about my friend. He seems normal around other people and stuff. But if I try to talk to him one-on-one -on -one after he's been quiet for a bit, I just don't know. I try to avoid looking him in the eyes. It's just creepy. I get a feeling like there's a pressure in my chest and stomach, just warning me to run. Number 5. I've met and have known gangsters, drug dealers, killers, ex-spec op soldiers, and two people that have killed their abusive, murderous parents in my time. I was never scared or intimidated by any of them because I knew they weren't crazy. All except one. We'll call him Kenny. Kenny was recently released from jail after 10 years. Apparently he has ties to the local mob and was actually pretty high up. We were sitting in a coffee shop when he came in. My friend is the son of one of Kenny's circle, so he comes over and says hi, introduces himself to me. Right away, I could tell this guy was off. He was cold in his demeanor, and he had dead eyes. He gave off a really bad vibe, like I could kill you without batting an eye. Anyway, I guess he was there to extort the owner of the shop. He was back in town, so he wanted his dues. After he had spoke with us, he had had a heated discussion with the owner. The shop got quiet. Kenny's entourage made their presence known and discouraged anyone intervening. At this point, the owner's girlfriend got in Kenny's face, and without hesitation, he started beating her mercilessly. No one could do anything without risking some serious consequences. Even the owner had to sit and watch while Kenny went to town on his girlfriend. It was disturbing. Needless to say, everyone noped the fuck out real quick. Never saw the guy again, but heard he got locked up again two months later on extortion and attempted murder charges. Some people just don't belong out here. Number 4 Back in the early mid-1970s, my mother and I lived in the Pacific Northwest. I was about six years old. We were on an offbeat road right out of Seattle. Very dark night, no moon and a wisp of fog. 
We saw a Volkswagen Beetle on the side of the road with their emergency flashers on, and a rather good-looking guy, as my mom describes him, with his arm in a sling waving us down. My mom pulled over, being the kind woman that would help anybody in need, and he looked normal. Mom rolled down her window and asked if she could help and the guy asked my mom if she could help him get the last lug nut off his tire so he could change his flat. So my mother introduces herself, and he said, Hello, my name is Ted, and then smiled, and then looked at me, reached over, and shook my hand and asked my name, and I think I got the bad vibe as well, because I said nothing to him. My mom said something about his smile really made her uncomfortable, and then she noticed that he was missing the passenger seat in his beetle. So she rolls the window back up and said she would call a tow truck to come help him at the next city, then speeds away while looking in her rearview mirror. She sees him taking off the sling and getting back in the beetle and took off very fast in the opposite direction. So that's the night, at six years old, I shook the hand of Ted Bundy. Number three. One time when I was about 17, my friend and I were out for a walk. We were underage at the time, so we had to do that when we wanted to smoke. He lived in Pilsen. For those of you unfamiliar with the neighborhood, it was a mostly Hispanic neighborhood in Chicago that was run for a while by gangs. It wasn't the worst neighborhood, but both of us grew up there. My parent moved when I was seven, and we went to school there. Now, it's pretty safe since gentrification, but back then it was still mostly run by gangs. We were used to walking around there and being left alone on our smoke breaks. This one time we were out, we went up to the street that was next to a giant wall with the train tracks next to it. People would tag it all the time, and the city would cover it up. So every time we walked by there, we would see something different on the wall. We were just talking and joking, when we saw a couple of guys in front of us. We were used to taking this weird interaction between us crossing paths, where we both just said, Hey, with a head nod and continued on our business. This time was different. The leader of the group kept walking behind us. Then he caught up to us and asked us to bum a smoke. I gave him one and a light. He took a drag and said, Let's keep walking. Both me and my friend looked at each other with a bit of concern, but we just kept walking. He asked us where we were from, my friend told him the intersection he lived on, and I told him one that I used to live off of. Now, keep in mind this guy was pretty intimidating. There was two of us, and we've gotten into fights before with guys bigger than him, but this guy was scary. His tone was really cold. He stayed a few steps behind us, and he was sketchy. He stops, takes a drag, and says, no shit. And we said yeah. Then all of a sudden, it was like we were talking to a completely different person. He smiled. He walked at our pace. He opened up to us. During that walk, he told us about how much he hated what was happening to the neighborhood and the effects it had on him, his business, and his family. After he finished smoking, he walked off back. I don't know how important he was to the gangs there, but he seemed pretty important. Most of all, he was a pretty scary dude to be around before he decided you were okay. Number 2 One time I was in an outdoor bar area with my friends getting a drink. I'm at the bar, it's pretty crowded. Dude comes up beside me and isn't really looking to get a drink. He's just kind of looking at me, really intensely. He's a really big guy, probably 6'3", 220 pounds plus of just muscle. 
and I'm like six foot, and maybe a hundred and sixty. And he nonchalantly starts talking about his favorite thing to do on a night out is to just punch an absolutely random person and see their lights go out, laying on the floor. He says he does it when he's coked out, which he insinuated he was. He just goes on and on about the thrill he gets from knocking someone out he doesn't even know. The things he said were probably more graphic and violent than I remember. While I think to myself, what the fuck do I need to do to get the fuck out of here? Not sure how the conversation turned, but he mentioned he was out in the town because he went through a breakup. He said, are you my bro? I was like, yeah man, sure, we're buds. Got my drink and said something like, cheers to all the fish in the sea or some shit. Got back to my friends and kept that guy in the corner of my eye all night. Number one, my mom. She told me stories about herself when I was growing up, but I always assumed they were all talk. You know, like she was pulling my leg. But the stories never changed and, as I got older, I realized that they stayed pretty consistent. So I asked family members for confirmation and they basically shrugged and said, Yeah, that sounds about right. Highlights include, my half-brother was watching a movie and mentioned that he wondered what it felt like to stab somebody. My mom nonchalantly said that it wasn't great. It turned out that she once stabbed a man at a party because he got on her nerves and she had a knife in her boot. But it was only his leg, so it wasn't that bad. She robbed the guy who robbed her at gunpoint. At gunpoint. Seriously. Dude showed up at her job with a pistol, took all the money in the register, so she chased him to the next town over, found him in a pool hall, and held him at gunpoint until he gave the money back. She has connections to people that I'm not allowed to know the names of, like people she considered, or considers, like brothers, who happen to buy new cars after hunting accidents happen. She once physically destroyed somebody for just mentioning that they thought they could take her in a fight. She didn't have any animosity. She said she had nothing against the girl. She just heard her talking shit and proceeded to calmly meet her out in a parking lot before she proceeded to snap her arm and crush every bone in her hands. It took three men to pull her off the chick. She did the same thing to a woman who tried to hit my grandmother with a rock from her flower bed. She knocked the woman off her feet and beat her head into the brick path leading to the garden until her front teeth came out. Then sent her home and dared her to call the police. In my hometown, I've seen her intimidate her way out of tickets. She wouldn't even say anything threatening. She'd do what they asked, but they'd always just apologize and send her on her way. Her ex-husband, he once stole her car. She decided that it was unacceptable, walked out to the bar he was at, hotwired it, and decided she was sick of his shit. He jumped in front of her while she was on her way out, expecting to stop her. She did stop, for a second, then she gunned it. When one of my exes started stalking me, she informed him matter-of-factly in the nicest voice I've ever heard that if he didn't stop, they would never find his body because it will be in pieces all over this country. I actually witnessed her beat the ever-loving hell out of a guy when I was a kid. He made a passive threat to her, so she went after him with all the fury of a goddamn tornado. She willed herself out of having seizures. I found it hard to believe until my aunt backed it up. She used to take medicine for it, but it made her sick, so she stopped. 
When the doctor told her she'd just get worse without it, she calmly informed him that she was done having seizures, and she never had another one. I think that's the creepiest thing I've heard about her. You know, next to the multiple stories of all of her friends who died or were murdered, which makes it seem like she was the last one standing. She actually told me that she'd probably be a pretty bad mother if she didn't have a massive brain injury in her early 20s. She has a dent in her head where her skull is thinner in places from the surgery. It's weird. Everyone has told me that she was quieter and meaner before and seemed kind of detached from things she did. But if you talk to her now, she's the happy, buoyant, and extremely friendly lady. It was like a complete personality shift. She has her moments, but she talks about her previous exploits in a way that's so chipper and surreal. By far, one of the potentially scariest people I know. Fascinating to talk to, a wonderful parent, and she fucking knows how to make a daughter feel safe. But I'll be damned if she isn't terrifying once something presses the wrong button. I mean... She almost drove two hours away to find a former co-worker because he threatened me via text. And I, uh, don't tell her what one of my exes did because I don't want to visit her in prison. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you yourself have got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit on r let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community, and you might even hear it featured here on the channel. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt.com, links in the bio. So thanks so much friends, and happy Halloween.